Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to today's Aerospace Nation. It's my great pleasure to introduce Lieutenant General Kevin Trapp Kennedy. He's the commander of 16th Air Force, which is responsible for information warfare. The functions under that umbrella include integrating intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, cyber warfare, electromagnetic warfare, weather, public affairs, and information operations. Trapp is also responsible for heading the Air Force's service cryptologic component and commands Air Force's cyber and Joint Force Headquarters cyber at Joint Base San Antonio Lackland. So thanks for being here, Trapp. We've known each other for a long time and it's been fantastic to follow your career and watch as you've tackled some tough challenges in your various assignments. So what I'd like to do to kick things off is basically hand this over to you for some opening remarks, and then we'll jump right into questions and then uh, finally get to the audience. So floor is yours. All right, thank you, General Deptula. And thank you for the Mitchell Institute and the Air Force Association for, for having uh, me here today. So I could talk about the, uh, the tremendous accomplishments of the 49,000 total force, 36,000 active duty airmen that are members of 16th Air Force. And so as 16th Air Force, as you've mentioned, um, we're responsible um, for organized training and equipping across 10 wings. And we're also responsible to the joint force um, through Air Force, uh, through uh, presenting forces for, on behalf of the Air Force, U.S. Cyber Command. And in that role, we also support STRATCOM, Space Command, and U.S. UCOM in, the, in that function. We're the service cryptologic component, and in that role, we would support the National Security Agency. Um, and so what we've done over the last, I've been in command now about almost a year and a half of it, at the end of the year, is um, we've taken on the initial of what was born out of two numbered air forces coming together under Lieutenant General Hawk's leadership. And then we've hit our fourth birthday just this past October. And then now we are moving forward with the ideas of convergence and really operationalizing that across three lines of effort. And, and first of all, it's... Um, is that we're generating insights across the force. The information warfare capabilities that you mentioned really help us generate those insights and really support the Joint Force and the United States Air Force and the U.S. Space Force. And so we think about the insights that we're generating that enable us to compete now at, <clears throat> as a Joint Force or as, a, as an Air, Air Force as we're thinking forward about how we do that in the information environment today in competition. And then we prepare for crisis and conflict and making sure that we are well integrated so we can, we can leverage those capabilities as we go through crisis um, and hopefully um, deter a conflict, but if we go into conflict, we'll be ready to do that. Um, and we've, as I think about the capabilities in our force, it's really, it's the dominant information warfare is the dominant activity when you're thinking about competition. When you move into a crisis, it is the critical or crucial capability that we need to understand what the adversary is doing and how do we leverage the information environment to position ourselves and gain advantage in the crisis. And then as we move into conflict, it's the essential enabler. As we're looking to gain information and decision advantage, so as we're employing forces um, across domains to make sure that we're ready to seize the initiative in the information domain and through our information warfare capabilities, to prevail in conflict and set the conditions um, for a peace after the conflict as we're moving forward. And so with that, we're truly a full spectrum force. We, we think about that as we're, as we're looking for as a global force, like we mentioned, and we're really working right now in the year and a half that I've been taking the idea of convergence and then how we converge these enterprises um, across whether it's ISR, cyber, EW, information, public affairs, like you mentioned, which is another information capability, um, or electromagnetic spectrum operations that you know, we lead from the 55th wing at Offutt. How do we bring those together to produce those capabilities and, and understand what the art of the possible is there? And so we've really moved from a deconfliction um, and some coordination towards more coordination, and in some places, synchronization of those capabilities as we're looking forward on that. Um, to get at that, one of the concepts that we're working is like we've been charged as the operational level of information warfare for the United States Air Force. So with that, the construct that we're building out is our Information Warfare Operations Center is going to lead this. So the 616th Operations Center, we're building a competition-based framework that allows us to pull across the other components. So whether it's the CFAC out in the Pacific or the CFAC in Europe or with the, the CFAC responsible to the Southcom, any of those across and to include the others, um, to think about how do we enable, reveal, conceal, um, expose, or disruption type of activities. And, and the idea that we're challenging our team with is how do we reveal capabilities to deter? We conceal capabilities to gain 
um, a level of defeating folks if we move into conflict because we need to hold those capabilities, um, steward the knowledge of them. We need to expose adversary activity. So expose malintent, expose exactly what the adversaries are doing, and then impossible disrupt activity um, of the adversary so we can deny what they're trying to achieve in competition. Because as we're seeing um, in many of the recent conflicts and, and as we've seen in the past couple of decades in great power competition, competition-based activities can have real strategic advantage. The best example of that would be the intellectual property theft that we've seen that have moved um, to the east by the PRC over the last uh, couple of decades of, out of our intellectual property base in the United States and in the Western nations very large. So that's really how we're thinking through that. Um, to, to get toward those outcomes, I've established five priorities in 16th Air Force. The first one is we've got to continue to grow our readiness. We have to be ready um, to be able to transition through crisis into conflict if necessary. And then how do we do that as an employed in place force? How do we grow our readiness in place to help integrate with the other portions of the Air Force as they're also growing their readiness? And so that's what we're looking at doing. The next one is how do we strengthen our resilience? This is the airman's resilience, but also the resilience of our ability to generate combat power and thinking through that in a, in a manner. The third one is how do we mature information warfare? I've already talked about the concept that we're using to drive that, but we need to continue to move that forward as the thought leaders for the United States Air Force at the operational level. We need to continue to do that. ACC, Air Combat Commands, our, our MAGCOM that helps us with that. And then on the air staff, um, it's the A26 and the A3 that are really helping us drive that forward. The next one is driving modernization. We, we, we have a modernization challenge as well, whether it's in our ISR enterprise of how we enable more processing and more seamless transition of machine to machine and getting our sensors to shooters aligned, um, or whether it's our processes of like with uh, General Alvin and General Brown before him about how we're driving and following through, like General Alvin told us the other day, on, on really accelerating a change in our processes to ensure that we are positioned for advantage. And finally, it's all about increasing combat effectiveness. If we're not aligning everything for that and enabling that force, yes, it's competition-based. We are the competition force. But if we're not thinking about the combat effectiveness of our force, um, that is our greatest um, to, to support to integrated deterrence. And, and at its essence, integrated deterrence is an informational outcome. And we're the information warfare NAF. And so we're positioning ourselves to do that. Well, very good. No, thanks very much for that uh, uh, overarching uh, introduction. Sure. Um, I think there's some great points there that, uh, quite frankly, just uh, in those couple of minutes, uh, educate folks in terms of just what your responsibilities are. Um, let's j jump into a couple of questions here, okay. dig a little bit deeper. I mean, I think one of the things that are on a lot of folks' minds uh, is the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, and wondering if you could speak a bit uh, to say what you can in the context of lessons learned to date on the use of cyber capabilities in an open conflict, uh, such as the uh, Russia-Ukraine war actually is. Absolutely, uh, yes, sir. So I, I can think, you know, I'll talk a little bit about information in cyber. I can't talk specifics, obviously, but I can, sure. can talk about the lessons. And so uh, previous to this position, I was the director of operations at uh, US Cyber Command. So I was in the seat as the J3 um, in, in the run up to the war in the end of 21 and then when Russia invaded Ukraine in 22. And what we saw there was the power of information and information sharing, both to enable our partner um, to pr defend themselves, enable coalition of the NATO and to really coalesce, and also um, enable ourselves to enable them to be the most defensive they could be on uh, the Ukraine. And that kind of transitioned into the cyber area. And so in the cyber domain, it, it's a uh, First, I think Ukraine learned quite a bit since 2014, and I think a lot of that came with a close partnership um, with U.S. Cyber Command and others, uh, as we thought forward, as they really got in a better posture and increased their resilience. Um, information sharing so they could understand a bit more about what the threat they would be facing, and, and also helping build uh, their defensive posture. We had hunt forward teams that went out prior to the conflict that were sitting side by side. Um, with Ukrainian forces um, so they would understand their networks and understand where the adversary potentially was in their network and help uh, expose that. Hunt forward operations is one of our key capabilities as we go forward that enables us to understand what the adversary is doing on our partners and allies terrain. Um, we can bring back some of those tactics, techniques, and procedures to understand how we can better posture and prevent them from coming into U.S. terrain. We can also see some of their tools and we can expose them, and we can work with industry and others to help um, posture that. Um, the other portion in the cyber domain, domain we learned is that you know, Russia um, was fairly indiscriminate. If you think about the Viasat hack that they did, took down by roughly 40,000 terminals across um, Europe, a pretty significant impact to economics as you went through there. But it was a fairly, you know, they're fairly 
careless on how they would have executed that operation, accepting a lot of collateral effects that weren't necessarily uh, meet the same level of, uh, of precision that we would want to use if we the United States were looking to create an effect that had a battlefield outcome. Um, so that's the first one. The, the second one we, we saw is the ability of, uh, of Ukraine to partner with industry to position themselves to be able to sustain some of the attacks um, that Russia was aimed toward them and to recover. They had a built-in resilience. And I think that is one of the things to take from this is the, the resilience and understanding your, your network and being able to leverage the most modern technologies and being and have your airmen um, or joint force members or government members that leverage the domain, being ready to use those tools and be able to position and posture themselves. So those are the big things that I've, I've taken from it. It's really the information sharing and, the, and like I mentioned before, the really crucial and critical element at play in a crisis. Um, also in the cyber domain of understanding our adversary and how they might target us, uh, but understanding the power of resilience and partnership between Ukraine, Cyber Command, the intelligence community, as well as industry. So it sounds pretty much like it was a two-way street. I mean, we, we obviously assisted, but we also learned from uh, watching uh, just what was going on and how the Russians acted as well. Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, with Russia, anytime we do a hunt forward, and especially in, in Ukraine, this wasn't the first time we had partnered with Ukraine on a hunt forward operation um, at Cyber Command, and we definitely learn as much as they learn as we're going through these activities. That's great. Wonderful partnership. Now, Trap operationalizing the Department of the Air Force battle network and integrating the advanced battle management system into uh, the C Jad C2 enterprise is obviously a varsity undertaking. Could you talk us through a bit about how you're approaching this task and, and your roles in uh, the entire JAD, C Jad C2 enterprise? Uh, absolutely. So as we think through Jad C2, uh, the, the command, if you can't connect, you can't do command and control. And so one of our wings, one and key for that is going to be um, as we think through, you know, our terrestrial networks. And we run those out of 16th Air Force. So the 688th Cyber Wing is our wing that runs our terrestrial networks, whether it's SAP networks, uh, JWIX networks, all the way down to unclassified networks. And if you think about the backbone that we're, that's going to run over, that's, that's absolutely critical. Um, we can also talk about some of the leveraging some of the technology. So we need to think through, okay, how do we do that? Now, the key place that we're going in this space is toward zero trust um, and enabling that type of outcome as we're, as we're moving forward. And what that means is, is more of a reliance on assuming breach in these networks and being more robust and understanding how we can get the information uh, around on that. Um, so that's, that's absolutely critical as, that we're thinking through and understanding of that's our portion of doing that. Um, the other one is helping the joint of the Air Force as we as we drive ourselves towards this architecture is how we're going to defend that architecture. Okay, so from a side, it's it's going to have um, quite a bit of surface area, but doesn't but it's also going to have some resilience in it. And then where do we posture our our cybersecurity service providers? Where do we provide? Uh, posture our comm professionals, how do we extend that network? Um, and then also where do we to put our higher level capabilities? We have cyber protection teams that we are given as AF Cyber, they're presented to US Cyber Command, we go through a global force management like process uh, where it's cyber force management and then they are given back to Air Force's cyber and then we can posture them in Air Force terrain. This is how, how do we defend that terrain? And we're part of the conversation in the beginning to enable us to really make sure that it's defendable um, it's resilient, um, and it's a learning system that we're building with respect to cyber. Um, it's going to be in and through the domain the, of the cyber domain to make JADC2 um, successful, and we're the professionals to help make sure that that's resilient, the architecture is built in a way that we can execute it with airmen in the right place to understand and leverage the technology. Do you have any personnel that are assigned up at headquarters Air Force and the cross-functional team that's working ABMS? We do not currently have personnel assigned directly from 16th Air Force, but we partner very, very closely with the A26. Okay. So Lieutenant General Lauterbach and her team are our air staff, our lead um, for these types of activities and her function as the two and the six. Um, and then we make sure we're integrated, the ACC down to us and all the way up to make sure that we are all understanding on the, the right processes. When I would talk with uh, you know, General Cropsey about this and, and hearing him speak about it, we're fully on board with making sure that we can sense do sense making and then com and then pairing the sensor to shooter. We're part of that activity, both on the connection, but also in the ISR enterprise, we're in making that connection in the sense and sense making. Obviously, clearly, we're the professionals that are going to get that done. Great. 
Well, now, it, it's well understood, or pretty well understood, that uh, skilled cyber professionals are difficult to recruit um, across an entire national security enterprise, much less retain them. Uh, and my understanding is that the Air Force plans to begin experimenting with a new cyber warfare career track. Um, what are your thoughts on how these efforts uh, might ensure a more robust um, cyber community throughout the Air Force? Right. Um, I would agree. We have lots of people that want to, that's the retention piece. Yeah. You know, the recruiting piece, you know, we have lots of folks that want to come and do what we do. Um, they're excited um, and they come in our force and they're excited about it as well. Um, but they're, you know, as we're once they're on the force, the you know the the draw from industry is pretty significant um, as we're going because the, you can do largely a lot of the same things, but not all. Um, and so that's one of the things that we offer is we do offer a mission um, that you're going to be able to do things in cyberspace that unless you're involved in a different government agency, we're not going to be allowed to do. Um, and, and so that's the first thing we're looking at is how do we keep the tide of the mission to help retain them? But that's not going to get us all the way home. The second portion that we look at is how do we capture the talent once it's in, in a different portion of our force. So we are a total force uh, cyber enterprise. And so whether it's in the guard, the reserve, civilian, um, enlisted officer, looking to see how someone could continue to serve in one of those roles in one of those components um, and seeing how flexible and, and really breaking down the barriers that we move across. And so we have a few initiatives that we're looking at there. One of them is uh, in the 960th, which is a reserve wing that's stationed with me in San Antonio, looking at how we have um, offensive cyber capability, um, airmen that have those training capabilities can come over and um, with some support for recruiting by Cyber Command to bring them right into that wing. And so we're, we're working on that. One of the areas also is uh, the Air Force is looking at is, uh, is a tech technical prioritization track, um, which was someone would be able to stay on the, and this is largely on the officer side, would stay in a technically minded positions wouldn't necessarily go out and do the staff job. This wouldn't be everybody, but there are positions in there that would do that. Sort of like pilots stay Pilot flying and, all the time. General, we, we both heard this conversation <laughs> through our entire careers, right? Um, and so I think there's some merit there. It wouldn't be everyone in our force. Um, it would be, uh, you know, portions of the force that would, um, we'd, the most bespoke training that we could send them to um, and get the high experiences and then keep them within um, whether it's in a cyber protection team whether it's on a, one of our our combat mission teams um, whether it's with the cyber national mission force or assigned with air forces cyber um, they would stay in those domain and continue to do those types of activities um, and then pop, move them over to networks but they would stay really close to the tactical and operational edge. They wouldn't become into the operational strategic um, portion of that. And so we're looking at, at that. The other one is bringing folks straight in. Um, there's a program we can do direct commissioning. Largely, we've leveraged this to bring folks from enlisted to officer. And, and what it enables us to do is bring them in as a lieutenant um, or a captain. We have the authority from Commerce to bring someone in all the way up to 06. Um, we're thinking through how that, we are line officers, um, so we'd have to think through, okay, how would that work within um, the force? And we haven't done that yet. Um, one of the areas that we're exploring is how we would have positional those would be positional related. So when you, you would be recruited into that position and that would be the rank you seem, if you leave the position and you didn't necessarily achieve the rank through normal boards, then you would revert back to your permanent rank. Right. Um, and so we're looking at exploring how I think there is merit of having one or two of those types of positions in 16th Air Force. And that's one of the things I'm working with General Lauder back on. As the 2-6, she uh, he, she's our advocate on the air staff to help get this aligned um, as we're going forward. So I think that will help us pull some tools to, to bring the talent in. Um, but the other portion is I really want to be, we've been given um, cyber accepted service, which is an ability to give market rate supplements to our civilians, depending where they are, to, to increase their pay a bit to, get, to help retain that talent in the civilian um, side of our business. And we're also looking at, do we have the role structure with Cyber Command for some of our presented forces? Do we have it aligned correctly? Um, and in other words, do the teams have the right skill sets? And are we, are we searching for something that's always going to be at a, such a small rate, but we're trying to get it at a big wholesale rate, and we're only going to get it at a retail rate? Um, and then the last thing that we're looking at is, um, as we think forward on our enlisted, is um, a bonus structure that enables us to give bonuses positionally versus AFSC wide. So if you're in a specific position and you're, you're performing the mission, then you would get a bonus while you're in that activity. And so help target and incentivize folks to stay in what is a pretty high op tempo um, enterprise on the cyber enterprise. Very good. Well, those are all uh, sound like great initiatives that uh, um, would appear to 
uh, uh, target the folks that right. you, you need to, to to retain them. Yeah, and what I thought, uh, one or two works. Um, I, I, it's the, the competition for talent. So if I get, if a, if a initiative gets one or two, I, of course, I'd love 10 or 20. Um, but if it's one or two, I'll take one or two. Yeah. Um, as, if, if that's our goal in a, in a quarter or a year, then, uh, then we're making progress yeah. in retaining the expertise yeah. that we need. Now, you mentioned uh, uh, Zero Trust uh, a little while ago in one of your remarks. And the uh, Department of Defense, the Department of the Air Force are currently migrating their information technology systems to a zero trust architecture, um, obviously to reduce vulnerabilities. Could you explain the implications of this measure for cyber defense writ large and then perhaps for CJADC2 overall? Absolutely, so uh, first of all, I think this is the right way for the, the departments is unified in our approach here from the DOD CIO, from Mr. Sherman, all the way down through Ms. Goodwine and into the force of the, this is the way we're going to do networking in the future. Um, what it is is a transition from a primarily a boundary defense that once you are inside the boundary, you have ability to move. Uh, what that allows, though, for is if our adversaries are able to get inside the boundary. Now, first of all, we're very good at keeping them out. Uh, but if they're able to get in, um, they can move laterally and, and really gain excuse me, access to some of our information and things like that. So we want to prevent that. So the concept now goes to assume breach. And so assume that someone's in the environment and then now we have to think about how we do um, zero trust. In other words, sharing the information, just if you and I were sending, I have, uh, you have to prove that you're uh, Lieutenant General Retired Dave Deptula to me before I send the information. And, we've, and there's some key capabilities to do that. Encryption of the information and then identity are really some of the key aspects as we're going forward on that. And, and once we get those capabilities in place, well, it's good, the biggest thing for our workforce, it's going to change how we do defense. So it becomes more of a understanding the behavior inside of the larger where the, where the network traffic is, where the information is, and understand what makes more sense. So it becomes more of an intelligence, um, even more of an intelligence activity and a baseline activity, and then a, a interactive understanding, okay, that's not you know, the tools, it's not necessarily tools now, it's behavior based and understanding the, assessing the environment versus one tool managing the traffic flow coming off a specific device. I think that's how it's going. So it's going to change the capabilities that we're going to look this field. And it's also going to change the way we do our training. It's going to, it's going to enable more of an operational activity versus a monitoring activity um, for our SOAKs. And, I, and we, we're already there. A lot, most, many of our airmen are doing the analysis and gaining those skills, but it's going to be even more present as we go forward. Well, that's great. Uh, a couple other things that are kind of hot uh, topics are autonomy and artificial intelligence. Um, obviously, they're becoming increasingly important uh, in future operations across the board. So how is the 16th Air Force uh, involved in applying both of these concepts? Yeah. There's two, two kind of traits on that. First, we're trying to make sure we're understanding the technology. So um, we've created a, 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 it's called the Phoenix Initiative within 16th Air Force. And what this is, is the umbrella that we have over our, our engagements with academia, national labs, um, and industry. And aiming to how do we become an innovation hub and how do we think through it was like, OK, how can we understand the technologies, understand where the best research is and within government and in industry so that we're posturing our airmen and our posturing our capabilities across all of our enterprises um, to do that. So that, that's being led by our technical director, Mr. Brian Cook at 16th Air Force, and he's kind of leading that outreach for us. And then, and then that way, when our wing commanders are in our, in our command chiefs and our other senior enlisted leaders and squadron commanders, they go out, they can understand, OK, this is how we're trying to to bring this under a singular umbrella to have you know deliberate engagement is kind of the is the buzz um, kind of the organizing principle that we're having underneath that. Inside of that, then we're, as we're looking for the AI, ML, you know, autonomy, machine learning, um, artificial intelligence, we see. I, you know, my opinion is there's kind of two places that it, I think we'll see it first, and then a third that I think there's opportunity. The, the first two that I think we'll see it first is what we just talked about with zero trust um, and having a level of autonomy and really leveraging AI to understand, okay, these behaviors are different, um, stopping networks, stopping information from flowing at this level, um, we're moving around and we can do it 
on certain situations, you know, it depends on the type of information, but I think it's a lower impact and the less risk of the, you know, putting AI instead of like a, in a targeting solution or something like that. So I think that's where we're going to see more artificial intelligence is on the defensive side of our networks. I think that'll be the first place that we really leverage it. And we're engaging with um, the Air Combat Command and, and the uh, CIO as we think through this um, and how we how do we field the capabilities that really enable us to, to leverage that? Um, the next portion I could see it is in our ISR enterprise. And so in our intelligence, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance, as we're trying to do that sensing and sense making, as you're aware of uh, from your time as the two, it's, it's, we have a incredible amount of data that we can get from our sensing, our, whether it's um, terrestrial sensor, aerial layer, space layer. There's lots of information and data. And then so kind of triaging that, I can see us using some level of helping us highlight, okay, this is outside of baseline. And, and really using AI to kind of highlight that then to our analysts who are then, you know, on the loop to kind of help in the processing. You know, I don't see, uh, I think it'll be fairly down the road before targeting decisions are made through this type of activity. But I do think it's going to help us kind of triage and, and align that information. And then the kind of entrail of those two areas is on the offensive cyber piece. It's like, okay, how can we help design capabilities that I would use on offensive that might be able to be more, um, take advantage of some of that a capability. Again, still person on the loop as we're looking forward on that, but how can I leverage those capabilities so I'm not as reliant um, for C2 at distance? And then we're thinking through on that. There's lots of implications with that. That's why I think it's going to be, you know, we have to think about the command and control. We have to think about the rules of engagement and how we how we do that in, in a um, combat environment and how we ensure um, compliance with the rules of war and things along those lines. You know, and LOAC still applies in cyber. So we got to make sure that we're doing that in a way, but uh, um, in a way that is uh, legal and aligned with our values. Um, but I think that's an area that we we're going to have to to explore to be successful. Very good. Now there's another area that the Air Force has been expanding into by necessity when you take a look, particularly at the Pacific threat. Although it's not limited just to the Pacific, and that's this whole notion of agile combat employment or ACE. Uh, and that, as you're well aware, primarily relies on dispersal of forces uh, to make the whole situation more complex for our adversaries. And you talked about the absolute need for connectivity. Uh, so how is 16th Air Force posturing to support uh, the ACE concept. Okay, so the the biggest portion we're doing is uh, within the 688th is we do have uh, the Combat Com Group down in Fifth Combat Com um, is stationed down in uh, Georgia, and and they are the the center uh, of the Air Force for really doing expeditionary communications. So there's lots of innovation going on across Air Combat Command and Air Mobility Command and other commands in the, you know in the Pacific and in Europe, uh, but as we're thinking through. That capable, what is that expeditionary capability going to be, and what are the requirements as we're going forward on that? And so, we're working with ACC. In fact, after this, I head down to Air Combat Command for um, General Kelly's uh, Commander's Conference, and that's going to be one of the topics is talking about okay, how are we going to do expeditionary communications in a way that we can train airmen to it, and that our wing commanders and our squadron commanders are understanding of the capabilities they're going to have. So, that's the first aspect of how do we connect the force when we're thinking the Pacific. So, it's going to be at times disconnected, at times isolated, at times limited bandwidth. But again, it's going to be at times. This is not going to be, part of the pun, it's not going to be binary as we're going forward on this, but it's going to be times where we're going to be connected and we'd be able to pull and push information to the edge, but we're also going to be disconnected. So a lot of times in communications, um, one of the operating constructs we think through is pace planning, which is you know primary alternate contingency and emergency ways to get information. Um, and how do we get communication and, and largely used for C2 and orders, but we're also now with how do we pass data? What are my, my means to do that? Um, and to be successful, we have to understand, we really have to get clear-eyed about what our data requirements are and what the latency of those requirements are for us to execute our mission. And what I mean by that is, do I need three hours of understanding of this, of this targeting area if I'm on an atoll in the Pacific, um, or do I need eight hours? And then I, then I build what we're calling a, uh, um, it's a hybrid cloud or a multi-cloud environment that has some processing and some compute power at the edge some storage at the edge, but I'm not going to replicate everything. Um, but we're also looking to, to connect through what we're terming transport agnostic. And Zero Trust allows us to do this because I could get identity. And identity isn't just humans. Identity is also machines as we're thinking through this. And, um, and then also the encryption to the point of that I 
I can use proliferated LEO constellations, I can use geo constellations, I can use fiber, I can use aerial networks, I can use digital high frequency communications. There's lots of ways to push information and I just need to understand what my no kidding requirements are going to be at the edge as we're thinking through that. So data requirements as we're going through are going to be really important for commanders as they're out forward in the ACE construct. I don't, when I talk to the team, I go the first salvo, I understand how that will go and I'm pretty confident it's the second and the third and getting the battle damage assessments and really where I need to go after that. Um, that if I were a commander out on the edge that I would want to be able to do. Very good. A bit of a follow up um, as our dispersed forces have to be concerned about detection by adversary ISR and cyber attacks and electronic jamming. I'm curious about how much focus 16th Air Force is giving to the cyber and electronic vulnerability of some of these likely dispersal areas. In other words, how can we prevent an adversary from using the host nation uh, human and cyber terrain to locate our forces? Yes, this is a this is one area we, we explored this last year and we continue to explore it through our iWebTAC. So 16th Air Force, we sponsor an information warfare WebTAC, uh, which then those insights will be flowed up into the Air Force level WebTAC in January. Um, and what we're looking at, it's, it's really an OPSEC approach that has to be really deliberate to come back to that word again, to understand how you do signature management. And it also is there's an education piece um, with our airmen um, to understand that they do have a digital signature that then is able, that the adversary is able to look at um, and understand, and in some cases might be able to aggregate up to generate insights on their side of the equation. Um, so our eye, WebTech, really focused on the tactical wing level, what can we do for OPSEC signature management and understand what the, what we're creating in the domain as we're going forward on that. Um, the other, the, the other key that we're talking with the airmen is, is the adversaries already looking to manipulate us through the domain through disinformation, misinformation, manipulation of the information that we have. They're doing it to gain insights. Um, they're doing that to shape our perceptions. And, and eventually, they're doing that to, to try and shape our behavior. They're doing that now in competition. They're going to take that same type of understanding and insights they're gaining on us now in competition and look to try and gain insight if we're in crisis and conflict. And that's what we need to build those reps and sets and really manage our cyber profiles as airmen today in competition. So then when we deploy forward, we're able to understand what signature we've already created. No, that's great. Um, now, Trap, at AFA's recent Air Space and, Space and Cyber Conference, you said that 16th Air Force's job is to develop Air Force capabilities to deny an adversary from realizing their strategy. So how is 16th Air Force working to integrate information warfare to deny information superiority to our adversaries while at the same time providing access for our forces. Right, yes. Yeah. So one of the ways, as I mentioned, is through how we're working through the Information Warfare Operations Center concept and how we're partnering with our fellow CNAFs on that to understand how our operations activities and investments in, in competition are creating a baseline understanding in the information environment and influencing um, the information environment, um, what our adversaries' perceptions are. And so we need to create the perception in, in our adversary. And when we look at the NDS, it, they, they list the to top two, you know, the pacing threat is the PRC, um, the acute threat is Russia. And as we look through it and think through those, uh, what are our OAIs doing with their perception that the United States Air Force and the United States um, if challenged, if our interests are challenged uh, and we are directed to do so, we will fight. And if, if that is the case, we will win. And then how are we supporting those? Now, when we're looking at our adversaries trying to create the negative perception that there is no reason to fight, um, that there is no reason to contest the PRC, um, where there's disinformation and misinformation, we're looking to um, expose that. We're looking, um, if it aligns with the authorities um, of our various hats, we're looking to remove the information, the infrastructure that they're using to propagate that message. Um, we partner closely um, through generally U.S. Cyber Command, but sometimes um, uh, the interagency, if we see terms of service violations um, and, and social media, social media is the battleground for this activity, um, the disinformation and misinformation space. And we see terms of service violations, we highlight those, a um, large, large number of, of U.S. companies as we're going forward, and we, and we do that. There's a lot of discussion right now about, you know, the, the PRC ownership of TikTok. Um, the, the 
grabbing of data of TikTok isn't my biggest concern. It's the manipulation of our perceptions and trying to shape our behavior is my concern. And uh, what we're looking at 16th Air Force as we're thinking through that, and, and this is a space where I think that all airmen should be thinking about, if your first reaction that you see something is an emotional one, you're being manipulated. Now that's a form of rhetoric, that's good, but then always look for those other forms of logic, of out of band, of don't take what you're seeing and just realize your social media feeds, especially on TikTok, are being curated by the PRC or those aligned to the PRC in ways that are pushing certain narratives and certain information and trying to foment dissent um, within our population as well as to um, push the narrative that's advantageous to the PRC. That's fascinating because all of us are watching that happen right now um, with respect to the um, conflict in uh, Israel with the uh, Hamas on a day-to-day -day basis. So how does your command get involved with using truth as a means of combating disinformation? Yeah. So how we get involved is we generate the insights. And uh, I stay away from truth. Sure. Um, because uh, what I do is what's our observations? What do we see? Um, what do we have understanding of, the, of what is being discussed by our adversaries? What do we have understanding of what they're telling us? Um, a lot of times, if you look at what your adversary is telling you, they're telling you exactly what they're going to do. You just have to listen. Um, sometimes um, President Putin told us exactly what he was going to do um, when he invaded Ukraine. Um, sometimes they don't until you see the activity on there. But, the, uh, but when we see these types of things through our ISR force or through our cyber force, um, we, we then work with the intelligence community or with US Cyber Command, um, or if it's inside of a, uh, with a public affairs capability and, and we go and we expose the activity. Light is the best, um, uh, you know, heat and light is the best source. There's a lot of disinformation and misinformation to help expose of this is the, these are the facts on the ground as we see them. Yeah, I guess accuracy is a better term. Right. Uh, and General Axon, we talk, what our goal in the IC is we're talking, when, you know, as a service cryptologic, we're talking, it's timely, accurate, relevant, and compliant intelligence. That's what we seek to do, and that helps us generate some of the insights. And when we think about what other things we're seeing, like electromagnetic spectrum operations, what we're seeing in electromagnetic spectrum, if we say if the activity is being talked about as one thing, but we're seeing all these signatures that imply something else, then we can highlight that as we go forward. That takes a level of agility that we're working forward in the department. So this is an area as we go into the competition with the PRC, the the... U.S. government and the Department of Defense inside the U.S. government have to get a level of agility that we don't necessarily always have, but inside of, uh, with respect to, we already have close relationships like 16th Air Force, which is kind of unique as the Information Warfare app. We have relationships at the operational level with Treasury, with FBI, um, with State Department. That is not a normal place that a numbered Air Force sits. Yeah, no, and, and it's a good point, and um, I know it's, <laughs> Uh, it's well above the issues that you're dealing with, but when you take a look at our national security architecture and our pillars, you know uh, that the going back and in referring to the the DIME acronym, diplomacy, information, military, economic, we have cabinet level agencies for three out of the four. The one we don't have a cabinet level agency or very much coordination is the information piece, uh, and again. Uh, no need to comment, but uh, I think we need, as a nation, to be paying more attention to that and how we do coordination across the entire government to take a whole of government approach in dealing with what clearly is uh, a fundamental element of warfare, and we see it going on every day. Right. Yeah, I won't opine on which cabinet, but I, what I do know is I do take a lot of our lead in what I'm working with. Um, the combatant commanders that I support it, it, from the global engagement cell, which is the operational level activity for the State Department. And we look at what their, um, the narratives that they're exposing as false and misinformation and disinformation, as well as the lead of what narrative that the, the foreign policy is of the United States with respect to the specific nation. So we do take a lot of our lead from them. Okay, we talked earlier about, and you, you couched it in the context of what you're doing on the 16th Air Force with uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Uh, but obviously, 
um, those elements are, are out there in the rest of the Department of the Air Force uh, and the Department of uh, Defense. And opinions range widely from fear to zealous uh, optimism. Uh, so how do you think about, beyond 16th, uh, the adaption of uh, AI and ML to um, uh, other Department of the Air Force missions? I think we we need to look for we need to be right on there to adopt it and understand what our adversaries are doing. I guess there's a couple of different frameworks that I think about it. The first one is I have to understand how our adversaries are looking to do this to make sure I can understand how what the red kill chain would potentially look at. And so for our role, it's like, okay, how would they leverage it? How can I disrupt it? How can I make it less effective? On our side, on, on the blue aspects of how I can use it to generate insights, I think a lot of that is really shifting through and understanding how I can be a fast follower uh, in this type to really leverage what industry is doing. I'm not sure, I don't think the department's the innovator here, but I think we can be a fast follower, especially with data. Um, a lot of the industry of how they leverage data, gain insights from data, I think there's a lot of fast following that we can do on that aspects of it. With respect to the other portions of the kill chain um, that we support in 16th Air Force, uh, we need to be able to, again, help it use it for speed. Um, this is on the loop. I don't think man never, you know, the person doesn't come out of the loop, but it has to be um, adjacent to the loop. If we're in the loop, then we're really not going to be able to leverage the tool. But if we're on the loop and we can have, um, can see how it's working, I think that's it. The other aspect is we need the safety mechanisms to be there that are also can keep up with the speed. So what I mean by that there are safety mechanisms, we have mechanical safety mechanisms to present mechanical systems are going offline. I think we need the same thing in AI. We have artificial intelligence systems. We also need artificial intelligence to be safety breaks um, as we're using these for to enable the person on the loop to be able to make the outcome that we're looking forward on that. Uh, but that, that's the, the space. The, the technology, I think, is close to an inflection point. It is going to impact um, how we are able to leverage data and how we're going to be able to make decisions um, and, and potentially produce ex effects. Um, but we need to control the environment as we would within our domain. So within the United States military, we need to think of how do we control it to ensure that it's compliant with LOAC, that it's compliant um, with the spins, the special instructions that we have, that it's compliant with the rules of engagement. And so we have to always have that in as just as we would any capability. Um, we, we would never give that over. We have to make sure it's compliant with all the laws to make sure that we're fighting according to our authorities. It's also aligned with our values as U.S. citizens. Oh, very good. And one last one before we um, open it up to Q&A from the audience. And you have the responsibility for Air Force weather. And so yeah. that's something we tend to take for granted. Uh, but it's absolutely essential for uh, joint operations across all the service components. Uh, so could you speak to us a little bit about the importance of the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program replacement and uh, why that's so important? Okay. Um, so we gain tremendous insights from our weather wing writ large. And so if you talk to anyone in the weather wing or anyone in the 16th Air Force and ask about weather, you know, weather shapes behavior. And sometimes you're, you're, when you're looking at the adversary, you're trying to understand what they're doing. And, and sometimes it's as simple as, well, the, uh, the weather is the reason that they did this sortie or they did this um, flight maneuvered in this way is because weather effects kept them from being able to generate a corning baseline. So that's, that's the first understanding. With respect to that specific satellite capability, um, as we go forward, we gain a lot of our insights from overhead as we're thinking for, you know, it's, it's heavily reliant on our overhead infrastructure to gain the insights. So as they're bringing on new capabilities, we need to continue to modernize those to really understand um, as we're seeing um, weather in patterns that are maybe coming a little bit of out, of the nor out of the norm. We're seeing more um, significant impacts. I, one of the bases that we have is, is off at Air Force Base. We saw the effect of uh, what I think was a 500-year flood um, there as those are coming forward. So we need to make sure we're ready for that. We all, I just visited Tyndall two weeks ago. We saw what happened there. Um, and so we need to make sure we're, that our models and our capabilities and our sensors at the, at over in the overhead are keeping up with uh, being able us to get the forces, understand for force protection, but also employment. Um, is if we are going out to make sure that, hey, this is going to be a, a, an operational construct that may not work given what we think the trends of weather patterns are going to be in this given period of time. Um, so it's absolutely critical. Our weather, our, our weather airmen are, are fantastic. And the other portion is that I'm really excited about having their information more, that they're data scientists. They work with data. That's what they do um, and understand models and how to do that. And so they're really bringing those insights into us is, is really helpful. Well, very good. Thanks for that rundown. And uh, right now, let's uh, uh, open it up 
the session to questions from the audience and you all know the drill when I call on you unmute your mic and please state your name and affiliation before uh, asking your question um, or you can submit questions using the uh, Q&A function here which I already have uh, quite a few so um, I'll wait for anyone to raise their hand but while we're waiting for that um, we've got a bunch of them uh, here's one from Mark Thompson General Kennedy, what new information warfare capabilities is the 16th bringing to the fight, and how are your airmen being trained for this new future? I would say the new capabilities, I would talk about it's new concepts, operating concepts, is really where we're focusing on it. How do we, the existing capabilities, we have public affairs airmen that are trained in, in how to get the messages out and how to, to transmit um, of what we're seeing to the to American population as well as global audiences. Um, we have cyber experts that understand how to uh, gain access and understand what's happening in that domain. We and clearly we have our intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance experts. But the biggest thing that we're doing right now is not a new tool but it's really understanding how do we generate, take these expertise, converge all those capabilities to establish that baseline. And the concept is a unity of effort. How do we generate unity of effort without specific unity of command? Yes, they're all within 16th Air Force, but their operational activities a lot of times are under the unity of command or op operational control by somebody else. And so that's where 16th Air Force we're really focusing on is that concept of, of that operational concept that enables unity of effort to generate those insights and the assessments and the baseline in the, of the information environment. And that's really where I think we're going to provide the most value is establishing that baseline of how operations, activities, and investments are having an impact on the adversary because we have the enterprises resident in our numbered Air Force um, to enable us to understand um, what potential causation and correlation have done for some of the things that we're doing there and establish that baseline. So if we do something in the future, we're able to go to senior leaders that are executing that and say, this, is, this, this operation was observed and this was the insight that our adversary took from this operation and then, then we can help think about our behaviors in that way. Very good. Here's one from Lieutenant Colonel Slagle at the Cyberspace Operations Integrated Planning Element at uh, UConn. What's your assessment of and vision for the current training and doctrine of information warfare in the U.S. Air Force when compared to our sister services? In short, how should we build the best force to conduct and support information warfare? Well, that's interesting because Lieutenant Colonel Slagle's in 16th Air Force. Um, so I'd almost turned it back around. But uh, as we're, uh, that's a great question. So where, where we are, you know, we, we train 14 Foxtrots, that's the, air, the specialty code inside the Air Force for that. It's um, the career field manager for that is uh, General Slife on the A3 on the air staff. Um, and, and, but it's a pretty small career field right now, about 150, give or take, um, uh, officers in that. And so as we're thinking through that, now the question is, okay, then how do we take the next step? And so how do we train um, folks as we're going forward on? Those are information operation specialists. Information warfare is bigger than that. Um, and so one of the ways that the Air Force that we're getting at that is the, the air staff is going to derive is driving the strategy and how we do that alignment. Um, Air Combat Command is gonna then take the next piece that MAGCOM does and looking to see what training and everything else we need to put in place and then we're gonna do an operational level of that. Um, so I think we're, we are still in the designing stage of that training and doctrine. We have some pieces. What we're still designing is bringing that together at the operational level. So I, th I think we're still in the design phase. Uh, as we're going to do that, we'll get into uh, more of an execution. That's what our activity is going to help. And we have more experience in that than a lot of places in the United States Air Force, just be based on our alignment um, with U.S. Cyber Command. So we have a lot more planners that have done the information operations planning um, and bringing together more of the information warfare capabilities. And that's one of the aspects that we're looking at of uh, bringing to the other um, CFACs as we're looking across out there. So there is an aspect. Uh, about a year ago, we brought all our commanders forward in 16th Air Force, and, and the question was like, hey, how do we get at that third priority, maturing information warfare? And a number of the areas we came kind of, one of them was, you know, information warfare, you know, evangelists, information warfare, um, you know, gold water nickels, we need to read. But the one that really was kind of across all five groups was information warfare training. Um, and how we can do, we have probably, we have a responsibility to help train the rest of the force and I, and based on our experiences and we're continuing to do that largely through the IWA concept. 
Here's one from Pat Tucker. What sort of aggressive cyber activity are you seeing coming out of the People's Republic of China aimed at Taiwan? And the second part, how has it changed over the past year? Okay, Pat. Uh, can't talk too many specifics. I can talk in generalities. I would think, um, so the PRC is extremely focused on gaining insights and footholds in our partners and allies, um, networks and systems. Um, as, much, as in similar place, the PRC is also interested in gaining those insights, accesses, and positions within ours. Um, all our, you know, one of the key initiatives in the Pacific for our key um, partners and allies out there is to work with them to help um, make their networks more resilient, make their networks um, in a better posture with respect to cybersecurity. Um, and where we have understanding, again, the, the, one of the bigger tools we use at um, U.S. Cyber Command is hunt forward operations to go do that. And where we partner um, with our, our partners and allies, we get on their terrain side by side, and we're able to help um, hunt and in some places have recommendations for better uh, posture on their networks as we're going forward and discover adversary activity. Uh, but I would say that that is the, the posture that they have as far as that. I won't talk to a difference in scale or scope. Okay. Uh, no, thank you very much for that. Um, here's one that you and I discussed a bit uh, before we got on, on screen uh, from uh, Dave uh, Babcock. The roles and responsibilities of 16th Air Force clearly impact the entire United States Air Force, the entire Department of the Air Force. Is there any discussion to transition 16th Air Force to a major command um, rather than remain a component of Air Combat Command whose mission is to be the primary force provider um, for combat aircraft? Yeah, I think that's a conversation that always ebbs and flows as we're as we think about organization, when you're thinking about a military capability, you, you have to have doctrine and organization. You have to have airmen that are trained to do it. And you need the understanding of the capabilities that you're going to employ um, as you're going forward on that. Um, so the question is, oh, do we have the organizational and the doctrine you know, set up correctly? Um, I will tell you, I get fantastic support from Air Combat Command. Uh, you know, as we're going forward, they have a large mission. We're the largest major command in the in the United States Air Force. But General Kelly and his staff um, support us extremely well in helping us do the um, the OT and E functions that we have um, to do, where we organize, train, and equip airmen and present and support the force. Um, with respect to the enterprises we run, the the resourcing and and the activities there, they're they're also very you know, well postured to do that and help drive the doctrine on that. They also do rely upon us though quite a bit to help drive that. Right. They do help. They do rely upon 16th Air Force to help drive doctrine, to help drive operational concepts. And I think it's a great partnership as we're going forward on that. There will always be conversations about different organizational alignments. Um, I, what I do know is I get great support on this one. Um, and if, you know, a lot of times the organizational alignments, before I go into those, I want to make sure that the value on the other side is going to go to that fifth priority, which is going to increase my combat effectiveness. Um, I can see arguments as we go forward in that, but that's generally what I'm on. So if someone came to me with an organization realignment, I'd have to say, okay, where is the value as we're going forward on that? Um, because right now, you know, Air Combat Command, U.S. Cyber Command, um, and the National Security Agency, my primary folks, and in the air staff are the ones I work with to make sure I have resources and budgeting um, and making sure that I'm, I'm aligned to execute our missions. The new uh, elevated MAGCOM, I'd have to understand what would be the increase in combat effectiveness if we think that's true and are the resources that would accompany that going to come along with that okay very good and as you said this has been a discussion item for many years right. yes, sir. Uh, going back uh, uh, over 20 uh, for me uh, just for the record i'm a fan of establishing a separate major command for information operations writ large to be able to uh, uh, to take an entire uh, Department of the Air Force view. Uh, but again, that's something that um, I think everyone out there is aware that uh, uh, is under discussion right now, not this particular issue, right. but organization writ large. And are we organized inside the Department of the Air Force in the most far reaching way to meet the challenges of the 21st century? Okay, here's one, it's a little more specific. This is from Andrew Rowan. Uh, sir, over the last several years, the Department of Defense has struggled to update hardware and software 
to meet crypto standards for Link 16. This led to older Link 16 aircraft and ground terminals being uh, ineffective for a period of time. What are you doing to avoid these pitfalls in the future? The, the biggest thing at 16th Air Force that we're doing um, is making sure that we're part of, we're well integrated. Uh, we were before, but maybe making sure our voice is extremely well heard um, in the modernization and challenges that we're thinking through as these platforms and in the fielding of the platforms to make them more agile and now they're updated, going more towards software enabled updates of encryption rather than having to go through firmware and hardware. I mean, even firmware, I'm okay, you know, but it's the hardware. We can't do these ma massive refits. I think it's just uh, getting in the production lines and doing that for our aircraft is just untenable. Um, the other portion is though the in the importance of it. You know, encryption is the last line of defense. And as we're thinking through, for just securing information and reliance on data, you have to the confidentiality, the integrity, making sure the data that you're getting is the data that was from your sensor or from your airman, um, as well as the availability is there. And encryption solves those first two. Um, and and helps help solve to those first two. So we have to make sure that we're staying up there. The way the if you're asking the narrative that 16th Air Force that we bring forward, a lot of time when we're thinking about making trades within fielding capabilities, is there's a lethality, there's a survivability, and it's a sustainability portion of it. Many times in the past, based on the threat, a lot of the encryption conversations were would end up over in the sustainability portion. It was the keys will expire, so to sustain the capability where they think it wasn't in lethality and it wasn't in survivability. Uh, I think now there's, there's a greater realization that it is highly cybersecurity and encryption and the role that plays does impact lethality and does impact survivability in a ways that we need to prioritize it higher. Okay, um, a lot of great questions here. Um, Here's one from an old mutual friend, uh, Bob Elder. Um, Kevin, thanks for a great presentation today. Have you experienced any issues with people confusing the artificial intelligence term with generative AI when most Air Force applications of AI are expert systems, neural networks, speech recognition, machine, machine learning, and other forms of machine intelligence that we've used for years? <laughs> All right, thank you, General Elder. Um, your question has more context and nuance to it than most of our conversations um, as we're going forward. But I think the Air Force, we're stepping into that. One of the ways that we're doing that is, um, you know, we do have an artificial intelligence accelerator up at MIT, which I just happened to have lucky enough to visit a couple weeks ago, um, where they're looking at trying to educate number of airmen either in in person or remotely as we're going forward. And so they can understand some of the applications of AI, like you said, whether it's expert, which is what I was talking about, an expert system type of design versus generative, which is uh, more of going towards an AI that would have cognition abilities, as you know, on equivalent to human thinking. Um, and, um, and so we're stepping into that as we're going forward. I know this is a priority um, of the air staff as we're thinking through AI is to, to educate across our force about how we're thinking about artificial intelligence and starting with the senior leaders and bringing in the access to that information as we're going forward. There are courses that we send our senior officers to um, to kind of understand how we're going that. But I, we're trying, uh, where I'm doing it our, inside of our command is trying to be very specific um, when folks are talking about it to say, hey, is this automation? Like General Deptula talked to, um, is this machine learning? Um, or is this a true, you know, artificial intelligence? But artificial intelligence is it inside of what kind are we talking about there? Is it expert system or like you mentioned, generative AI? So that's where we are in the conversation now is, is really working on our language. The taxonomy and the language matters. And in 16th Air Force, we're looking to really square those terms away. Well, thanks very much, Trap. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of this uh, Aerospace Nation. Uh, in behalf of everyone here at uh, Mitchell Institute and the Air Force Association, we wish you all the best in the uh, remainder of your uh, tenure as a 16th Air Force commander. And to everyone out there, uh, we'd like to wish you all a great air and space power kind of day. Thank you. All right. Thank you.